Happy Thursday, everybody. Josh here with On The Wrong Lead. Another episode of Drank and Champagne. Joined, as always, by Mr. Champagne himself, Andrew Champagne. Andrew is pointing at Saratoga right behind him. It's Bellatoga Week. No, it is not Bellatoga Week. It we is Bellatoga Week. We are not getting week. a venereal disease. Bellatoga, Belmatoga, stop it. Just stop it. Everybody out there, stop it. Yeah. I, you hate I, fun. I hate fun. Josh hates money. And that's why we have a successful horse racing podcast. By the way, we're both drinking water because we're lame and it's a very long week. Oh, man. I don't know what it was right before we started recording. I was like, I think I, I had this realization I had not drank enough water. So I went downstairs to get more water. I literally drank an entire glass and filled the glass up, and I feel like I'm like slurping this thing down. So yeah, I got um, a whole bunch of ice in this one because it hit triple digits up here in the Bay Area on Wednesday, and my studio slash guest room where I record podcasts and video hits and all that good stuff is uh, incredibly warm right now. I'm not <laughs> saying it's a sauna, but you can see it from there. But you know what? It's okay. This is a big, big week. We've got Saratoga starting up for four days and four days only on Thursday. We are looking at the late pick four on a jam-packed Friday program. There's a lot to look forward to this week. I'm excited. Even Josh is excited. And you know how rare that is. I mean, my goodness, even Mark Capitan is excited, people. That's how you know something big is happening. Well, Mark just loves Saratoga. So uh, any any Saratoga, even if it's not real Saratoga, is... Uh is good news to him. So, uh, I know he's excited. He's already, he's going to be on track, uh, today or well, tomorrow, uh, when we're recording this, but, um, Thursday, yeah, he's going to be on track. He's going to try and be on track. I think all four days. So I mean, um, good luck. Saturday tickets are not cheap. Yeah. I mean, I think he took care of that a while ago, but okay, uh, he's already cut the hole in the fence. Got it. Yep. He, yep. He's ready to go. Okay, good. Just making sure. I mean, you know, if there's anybody out there that knows how to sliver through tight spaces, it's me, which <laughs> leads to the story that I can tell you now that I could not share with you and our loyal listeners last week when I was recording this show in the friendly confines of my fiance's parents' house's guest room. So I was dog sitting most of the past week because my fiance's parents went to Mexico for a wedding. They had a great time, came back, a lot of sun. There were many bottles of tequila that they flew back with them that I'm sure they're going to enjoy wholeheartedly. Um, Wednesday of last week, I did something that I was going to try to keep secret, but realized I couldn't hide from my fiance or her family. Wednesday morning at about 10 o'clock Pacific time, I realized the dogs needed to go outside. So I went outside with them their back door goes out to an enclosed yard area. Door closes behind me and it locks and I don't have keys or my cell phone, which I left inside. Immediately I'm thinking, oh shit, what the hell am I going to do here? Because my fiance, bless her heart, fifth grade school teacher, she's not going to be home for another five hours. And I'm on the clock working my day job for winnersandwiners.com, which, by the way, is a fantastic resource for all of your sports betting needs. Cheap plug right there. What I wind up realizing is several windows in the house are open. There are a couple of window screens that are designed to keep bugs out. I wind up finding a window that goes to the room that I'm staying in. I grab this ladder that's three or four steps high, wind up shimmying the window screen off of the window, get up to the top step, sort of flop down onto the windowsill, rearrange myself so I'm sitting on the windowsill with my legs hanging out and the rest of me hanging in, shimmy over to the top of a dresser that is right there, right at about window level, conveniently enough, somehow wind up getting back in the house without falling or injuring myself. 
Josh, I kid you not, that sound you heard last Wednesday at around, say, 10.15 or so Pacific time, so 12.15 for you uh, Central time, was me screaming, I am the smartest man alive! <laughs> and by the way, for those asking, the dogs were fine. They very much enjoyed the sideshow. Now, when Alicia, my fiance's parents, and her aunt got home, I told them this story. Alicia had absolutely no idea. I kept this quiet from her because as any person with a fiance or spouse will attest, you don't want to tell those stories because they can only be used against you hmm. unless you are in a particular situation where that person is outvoted. I told the story and Josh, God love these people. They laughed and found it hysterical. And because they laughed and found it hysterical, my fiance couldn't admonish me for it. I win. Josh, I won. I, you know, I, I'm laughing, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I've locked myself out of uh, our condo uh, at least twice. Uh, once, funny enough, once uh, was in... It was in the winter. Oh, no. It was during Turfway Park. Oh, no. And I was on Discord, and I was I was messaging her. I was like, guys, I just locked myself out. And my wife, I think, I don't remember where my wife was, but she was probably about an hour, hour and a half away like from getting, getting back. And luckily, I had like, I had my phone, and I had... I was warm enough, but I was like, it, it was cold. I'm like, all right, I got to walk. And then I proceeded, I think, hit three exactas in a row at Turfway Park to the point where everyone was telling me that I should probably lock myself out more often <laughs> as I'm just wandering the streets at night, just, you know, playing playing Turfway Park because I got nothing else to do on my phone. Um, the, the second time that this happened was uh, I was a little bit luckier because uh, I was actually on my way to a brewery for a game night with my friends. But I was playing on driving. And I, I get out, lock the door behind me, shut the door, and then realize, oh, I don't have my keys. Oh, darn, what a pity. And at this point, my wife is, um, I, I forgot if she was babysitting or or something, but she wasn't going to be back for hours, right? Because I had planned on being gone the whole night. So I'm like, well, I got my phone at least, and I had the board games I was going to bring. Uh, funny enough, so I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to Uber. So I Ubered over to the brewery uh, and texted my wife. I was like, yeah, just let me know when you get home, and I'll Uber back. But uh, yeah, I can't get into the house right now. But uh, you know, my, my wife likes to say that things come in threes, so uh, there, there will be another time uh, relatively soon, I believe. I'll, I'll be locking myself out. Well, just uh, now know that when that happens, you need to share your story on this podcast because our listeners are going to come to expect such antics, hijinks, and shenanigans. And by the way, shout out to Orange Theory Fitness in Lafayette. I'm down about 15 pounds over the last six months and have become a lot more flexible. That helped with me shimmying my six foot five, 250 pound body through a window. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait. Do I have the ding? ding. We're I dinging. Don't. No, I was, I had thought, I, 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 I think I took the ding off. It was warranted, though. It, it, it's one of those things where you need a visual aid. And some people out there have not met me. Some people would say that's a fortunate thing. Hi, Alex. How you doing? Um, but yeah. Oh, so, I don't have a ding, but I have this. That'll work. Anyway, so yes, adventurous week, but thankfully the dogs wound up being taken care of just fine. Everybody's back from Mexico and tomorrow, today, I guess, if you're listening to this on Thursday, I am headed to my fiance's, uh, fifth grade promotion ceremony where her class is being promoted up to sixth grade. I put together a video slideshow of the kids through the years. And my goal is to make every single parent in attendance cry. My ratio of those that have cried so far that have seen the video is pretty darn good. I am proud of myself for this one. This is an annual labor of love that I do. It's my annual gift to her school and it's something that 
I think I'm pretty proud of this year. And hopefully that winds up being four out when I see the Kleenex start coming out uh, on Thursday. I, what did I, I, felt, do now? I don't know. I felt like I had to play. Okay. Sound you're there. just I, using all the soundboard <laughs> things. Okay. I was going to say, like, I, I did a video for my fiance students' families. How is the law and order gong applied here? Well, in the criminal justice system. Yes, uh, of no, course. We're, in we're the not. criminal justice system, we talk about the late pick four on Friday at Saratoga that starts in race number nine. Gong, gong, da, 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 da. Hey, Jerry Orbach was a horse player. Just saying. Um, having said that, Josh, when we talked about what we were going to cover on this show, and you mentioned something on the back half of the card, I was relieved because the front half of Friday's card at Saratoga is freaking impossible. <laughs> and I say that as somebody that has handicapped and given out tips for every race at Saratoga, with the exception of 37 days since 2013. This card is hard. It is incredibly challenging, but I think there are ways in which you can make some money. And you know what I'm going to do, Josh? I'm going to give people a bonus. If you want to play the late pick five, which starts in race number eight, I've got a single for you in there, and it's horse number six, El Copy, who I believe very well could be a stone-cold freak from the barn of Rick Dutrow. That first out effort was absolutely electric. I don't know what he beat that day, but you don't see Rick Dutrow-trained first-time starters go seven furlongs in 121-4 and four at Aqueduct. You don't do it. This horse, to me, has the potential to be a serious, serious racehorse. And due respect to the Chad Brown entry and their specifically number one general partner, nice horse. But I think that one may very well be prepping for something down the road. This race, clearly not the goal. Give me Al Copy trying to clear the conditions for Rick Dutrow, who we all know can get a horse ready to run off of a long break. And if you're going to play that late pick five, you can play my late pick four ticket for the exact same cost because if Al Copy doesn't win, I lose. Yeah, I unfortunately did not look at this race uh, since we were uh, going to talk okay. about the late pick four. I just wanted to create some value for our viewers. I, I will say that that El Copy is a type of horse I would try to bet against next time out. Uh, freaks on a muddy track at Aqueduct, uh, and you look at that uh, that breeding, and that just screams mutter. So, you know, but you have a Chad Brown entry in here. That's gonna take a ton of money, so you might you might get a fair price on this uh, on this six. So I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna completely you know be against, but like if this you're not horse, gonna yuck my yum as the kids say. I got it. Sure, sure. I'm I'm not gonna do that. That, that definitely not. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is kind of you know uh, not uh, not hidden scroll, but hidden scroll esque. Uh, I mean, it could be, but by the same token, the last time Rick Dutrow had a horse like this, it was Big Brown, who I saw freak at Saratoga breaking his maiden first time out on the turf. Dutrow does not have horses that do that. And when they do, it's notable. This isn't a first out Todd Pletcher freak show where he debuts 50 of them in a year. This is Rick Dutrow, who is... Yes, he can run horses back pretty frequently, but he's also not averse to giving horses plenty of time to see if they need to mature. That was a hell of an effort, man, and I just need to bet that horse, him coming back. We go to race number nine now. This is the grade two Intercontinental, which means your winner will be the new Intercontinental champion. If you had the over-under on wrestling references, I believe we're at about 14 minutes in the show, so check the line and go to the windows if you cash. But at any rate, you've got a pretty good feel for this race. But I simply think your morning line favorite is head and shoulders above this group. Josh, what do you think? Um, you know, I was uh, I'm a little concerned about the six. I mean, the six obviously can win in this race. I, I have it. I, I'm using. Uh, I have it as a B uh, in oh, here. Oh, that's supposed to be a B. Okay. Yeah, it's a B with a question mark next to it. Okay, I wasn't uh, sure what exactly that was supposed to be. You know, and I, I, I was actually trying to look this up because I believe um, Clement was a little worried if uh, if we get any kind of rain 
that he's he's not a huge fan of uh, of running this horse on on wet turf. Um, I, I have to look it up. There's an article on DRF talking about it. So, you know, I, I it gave me a little pause. Um, obviously, this horse has run uh, run on good turf. I mean, one that the Giants caused her last time out on good turf. Uh, three back uh, and the turf monster on yielding turf. You know, lost as the you know three to five favorite. Yielding was being kind. They should not have run that race on the turf. But you know, I, I mean, if the, if the turf just ends up good, um, you know, probably not really a concern. I mean, this horse does have three wins on good turf, so um, yeah. I, this was this was the 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 moment where I wanted to be against, but I don't hate money that much. As as much as you you like to say I hate money. Oh, don't worry. Your ticket does indeed indicate that you hate money, and we'll get there. That's called foreshadowing, kids. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I just know that um, that Clement had shown a little bit of concern, depending on how much how much uh, cut was in the ground. So you know that gave me a little bit of pause. Um, but I and and obviously you know I've seen the weather report. Um, it's changing surprise. The weather in Saratoga is, uh, ever changing and, and you don't know. I, I heard somebody say it could rain all four days and then somebody says, well, it looks like it's clear. And then I think, uh, Mark said something about three quarters of an inch on, on one of these days. Like, I don't know, obviously, uh, you gotta be flexible, uh, keep the head on the swivel, take a look at the, at the weather. Um, but that that was that was my only real concern with roses for Deborah. Um, obviously, um, that race last out. I mean, wins this race. Uh, I think pretty easily. But I, I wanted to use another horse in this race um, that is kind of a kind of a horse for course, or at least as a not not necessarily the horse for course, but ran probably her best race of her career. Here at Saratoga, going five and a half, and that's the number two coffee maker. Luis Saya stays aboard. Obviously, uh, you know, had back to back wins um, last year, and then went to um, uh, went to Keeneland in the fall, and you know, the the the, the doors just kind of fell off there. Um, you know, the horse had won at Keeneland before, but had a couple of uh, had a couple of. I guess, uh, questionable starts there, but that Saratoga race looks good. Um, obviously the inside draw helps and you get, like I said, for my money, probably the best turf sprint jockey, uh, around in Luis I is aboard. Um, so I really like coffee maker here, um, at, at a bit of a price to, uh, to maybe, maybe uh, pull an upset here. I'm also going to use the six roses for Deborah, who I know is your lone single here. Um, but, I'm going to have more of my money going through coffee maker in the hopes that we spring a bit of an upset. And, uh, you know, I, there's a lot, if, if the six loses, there's going to be a ton of dead tickets and I'll definitely get some value here off the two. So my concern with coffee maker, isn't the talent. It's not even the layoff. It's the fact that coffee maker is three for four with Lasix, which makes her one for seven without it. I feel like Lasix is a performance enabler with her. That race two bag does put her right there, but she had Lasix that day. And I think there's a difference between Coffee Maker with Lasix and Coffee Maker without Lasix. Having said that, you're getting 10 to 1 on a horse with a ton of early speed. The 10 to 1 shot that intrigued me underneath a little bit was a different one, and that's number eight, Gallon of Rush. The other Christophe Clement trainee came off the bench with a pretty good effort in the license fee last time out, was second beaten just the neck that day, had every right to need that race, and she got pretty good in the midpoint of last year before needing to go to the sidelines. One of those races was a win over this very turf course. I believe I was there that day. I'm not 100% sure, but She seems to be training fairly well, and if she steps forward off of the license fee, I think she's got a shot to run second or third at a pretty nice price, given the connections. But assuming Roses for Deborah runs, I think she's far and away your most likely winner. I'm singling and moving on. Okay. Let's move on to uh, to race 10 here. The Chad Uh, Brown Invitational. (laughs) Yeah, and... Yeah, uh, you know, I... 
landed on two Chad Brown horses in this race. I think you took all the all the Chad Brown horses. In the words of the immortal Big E Langston, two ain't enough. I need five. Here's the thing. How many times as handicappers have we been burned by the other Chad, the other, other Chad, the other, other, other Chad? You get the picture. I don't know which one of these is going to be <laughs> ready to run. I don't know which one of them is going to get the trip. I mean, there are two speed horses in this race. They're both trained by Chad Brown. You know, both aren't going to go and burn themselves out. What if one of them gets loose? I'm using all five Chad Brown trainees and I am moving on. I am taking the element of guesswork out of this race. And you know what? If Mission of Joy or Evie Jets somehow winds up winning this race, I will tip my cap and I'll move on because I do not like either of those horses in this particular spot. I just can't get there with either of them. Yeah, I um, I looked at this race and this race screamed Naira special to me. Uh, this race screamed... There's going to get a, a horse is going to be on the front end, going to lope around at 50 to the half and, and going to win. And so I kind of, I narrowed it down to, to, to the Chad Brown horses. Um, I, I think the seven white beam uh, seems to be the one that has the most early speed. Um, and, you know, uh, kind of went off form a little bit at, at the end of last year. Um, you know, with a couple of fourth places there, um, and uh, you know, came back in, in, in the the Bogey and finished uh, finished second in that race as as the favorite. Um, you know, I obviously I don't think that that was the um, that was the target. I think the target was this race, uh, and the target is is coming into the summer. So um, you know, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll leave that one as kind of a prep for this race here. And I, I just think this is a, there's a really good chance that the seven white beam just gets out there on the front end and has it all her own way, especially with the fact that all the other Chad Brown horses are, uh, you know, I mean, they're going to run their race. And yeah, I, I just don't see there being a ton of pressure. If the seven does get any pressure or if uh, Flavian gets, um, gets instructions that, hey, hang back a little bit, um, I think the horse that will get the the lead would be the two. And you know what? I don't even know how to pronounce this this horse's name. I don't either. Let's just call it the two horse and be the done. two horse butte butte cache or cache or whatever. Cache um, sounds nice. Let's go with that. Yeah. And this is a horse that last time out went wire to wire in the Jenny Wiley at 25 to 1. And this was the classic other other Chad or other 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 Chad uh that just completely boomed everybody. Um and you know, I, I'm just thinking, hey, if the eight is basically being told, you know, let the two just go, I, I just don't see any other pace pressure, right? I don't see the two and the eight dueling, right? That's not going to happen. So um, I, I'm basically hoping that one of these two horses gets to the lead and, and wires. And if not, the, the horse that's sitting in second, you know, if if the eight sits kind of off is good enough to go ahead and pass the two down the stretch and uh, and win. So I'm only going to be using the or the two and the the seven. Sorry, I keep on saying the eight, but uh, the uh, the seven white beam and the two. Um, oh goodness, I'm like having mouse problems here. The two it's butte okay. cachet here. So I'm, I mean, I got to tell you, if you're going to use the eight in this race, someone will give you a really nice price. <laughs> Yep, this is uh, this is what we do the night before Saratoga, folks. So at any rate, we now move on to what I think is one of the most fun races to handicap of not just Friday's card, the entire week. I'm referring to the grade one New York stakes. Phillies and mares going a mile and three sixteenths on the turf. And I got to tell you, Josh, I think the distance is a big big deal here because you've got horses doing all sorts of fun things with distance. You've got horses stretching out for a mile. You've got horses cutting back for a mile and a half or a mile and three eighths. This is a really cool race that's drawn about as good a field as I think Naira could have possibly hoped for in this spot. And it's a fantastic betting race. Yeah. I think, I think you're going to get your price on, on, um, on whichever horse that you think, 
uh, think can win. I mean, maybe the exception on the the uh, uh, Appleby runner, the uh, William Buick English Rose here, the two. Um, obviously, William Buick coming over is uh, is usually a, a big deal. Um, you know, to ride these. Uh, you know, finished second in that Jenny Wiley that we just talked about a little bit, but um, going to be getting a, a little bit more distance under um, under her. And you look at that pedigree, and this horse wants to go. I mean, just wants to run, wants to run as long as possible. So, you know, maybe the added distance will help uh, will help English Rose, and and you'll you'll get to see uh, see her best. Um, I'm fading in uh, in this spot, and. Andrew, if I remember correctly, I believe you're fading as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, both of us are, are, are fading the morning line. Um, we have two horses in common. Uh, I'll let you talk about the other two, but I guess kind of my second or third choice in this race uh, and, and going to be kind of a, a bit of an outsider, I think, is going to be uh, the Chad Brown uh, horse, the one, McCulloch. And this is a horse uh, that you're kind of talking about. This is one of the horses on the cutback. But you know, it does have a win at going uh, or has a couple wins going a mile and a half. Um, has a couple wins going a mile and three eighths. Um, you know, it, I I do think that you know seeing this horse going a mile and the eighth is a little bit sharp. So the mile and three sixteenths, uh, you know, mile and a quarter distance, I think is kind of the the bottom end of where I I would like this horse. But this is a horse that hasn't hasn't finished worse than second here at Saratoga. It's got two wins and two seconds, albeit at different distances. But I don't know. I, maybe this is just a horse that that loves Saratoga, and uh, if she can throw her best here, I mean, you're getting ten to one on a Chad Brown horse that has has a fair bit of uh, of back class. I mean, mostly grade twos and grade threes, but um, it is definitely a horse. I mean, six for six wins and sixteen starts isn't you know. Isn't exactly a horse that uh, that doesn't like to win. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to toss McCulloch here on most of my tickets. Uh, I I also really like the uh, the three and the ten, but you like them too. What what, what do you like about uh, about Didia and Warlike Goddess in this spot? Before we get to those two horses, and Josh, I feel like you have bet Didia in every single mm -hmm. one of her starts. Yep. I'm going to go back to English Rose for a minute because we're in New York. We need to do the thing. As the great handicapper Harvey Pack made a career of saying, never bet a horse as the favorite doing something it's never done before. English Rose hasn't gone beyond a mile and an eighth. She did the mile and an eighth race in Dubai against a group where I'm not entirely sure what she beat. The group one races in Dubai tend to draw world-class fields with horses coming in from Europe, horses coming in from Japan and Hong Kong sometimes. The group two races, dodgy. I'm not saying she can't win, but I also wouldn't be surprised if this is a case where Godolphin is sending a second stringer over in hopes that this is a good enough horse to win a grade one race here in the States. It certainly seemed like William Buick, for as good a rider as he is, sort of fell asleep in the Jenny Wiley, letting the winner get away on an uncontested lead through fairly slow fractions. Could this horse potentially like more distance? Maybe. I think three to one is way too short, especially against a good field. This hits me in a sequence that's otherwise pretty chalky as the favorite you're supposed to try to beat. Because if this winds up going favorite, favorite going in and the favorite wins the acorn, pick four isn't going to pay squad if English Rose comes in. I think you're supposed to try to beat her in this spot. The fact that Josh and I agree on that should scare the hell out of him. But <laughs> we agree on two of those horses. Didia is my top selection. She comes in off of that race in the Jenny Wiley and she stretches out to a mile and three sixteenths. A mile and a quarter sure seems like her best distance. She was second in this race last year, going a mile and a quarter behind market segmentation, who, as I recall, got loose on a very easy lead down at Belmont. She then came back a couple months later, won the Rodea Drive at Santa Anita, going a mile and a quarter. And then earlier this year, she wins the Pegasus World Cup filly and mare turf over a decent field, 
going a little bit shorter than I think she wanted to. Jose Ortiz, I thought, rode her beautifully that particular day. This is an incredibly classy mare, 10 of 16 lifetime. And when Nacho Correas gets a horse going well, they tend to stay on the right track. Nine to two hits me as a very square price. You mentioned Warlike Goddess. Uh, with her resume, how is this horse not favored in this particular race? You're talking about a horse that's beaten the boys multiple times, a horse that's contested the Breeders' Cup turf and was four lengths behind August Rodan in last year's renewal of that race, a race that featured up to the mark and Sharar and some really nice horses from both Europe and the United States. I know she's coming in off a layoff, but she's run very well fresh before. She just needs a pace. I think she's going to get one. I need to have her on the tickets. As far as shippers are concerned, though, the one that I want to use is number five, American Sonia. What has American Sonia done wrong to this point in her recent career going back to October of 2022? This horse always seems to show up, always seems to run well, came to Saratoga once last year over a very soft turf course, had a very strange trip. Turning for home, she winds up out on the far side of the track, eight to nine wide. I don't know if she was winning, but that was just a really weird trip that I don't think is going to replicate itself. And I have seen Frankie DeTori win on European shippers in the United States way too much to toss him at a price in a spot like this. Three and 10 are probably my A's. American Sonia is my B. I would like McCulloch a lot more if this race was a mile and a quarter even, or a mile and three eighths. I think she wants a little bit more ground, but I am not going to talk you off of that horse at 10 to one. The horse that I am scared will boom me. Not because I think this horse has a shot, but because I bet her in what seemed like every start she ran going back to the 2022 Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf is the eight be your best. And Josh, you talked about how McCulloch is a horse for course. Be your best is two for two over this turf course. If be your best does something that she has not done in almost two years, which is win a race and does so at a gigantic number after I have tried her multiple times, that's going to be an I quit gambling for at least 20 <laughs> minutes horse for me. Uh, be your best as a horse that I thought was sitting on a lot of potential as a two-year-old and never really kicked on, though she did run second in a couple of quote-unquote grade one races. How are the Del Mar Oaks and American Oaks still grade one races, by the way? Can we talk about that for a second? I live in California. Those races should not be grade ones. Just throwing that out there. Three, five, and 10 for me. If you want to throw the one in, if there's a scratch somewhere else in the sequence, I understand that, but the one would probably be a C for me. I just think that one needs a little bit more ground than she gets, but she's a very nice horse, and I can't fault you for getting 10 to one on a Chad Brown, a Rod Ortiz horse that's won a lot of big races. Yeah, so the the two other horses that I did look at, I mean, obviously the five you already mentioned, Um you know, that was definitely one that I, I was kind of kicking around whether or not to use. Um, I mean, I think you said it best, right? Frankie DeTore is taking a mount from uh, from shipping in uh, overseas. Joseph O'Brien, not necessarily the best uh, best record when uh, when shipping in horses. I know last, last year or maybe it was two years ago, he tried to have kind of a – uh, stable in New York and they just, none of the horses really ran. So, um, yeah, but I mean, you're going to get a price on this horse. You know, if you're getting, you're getting 10 to one as opposed to getting, you know, w w last time he was shipping a bunch of horses over, you weren't getting, they were all getting bet off the board and they weren't running. They were, so, yeah. Um, so if, if you get that, if you get that price, uh, definitely an include, I have a feeling that uh, if Mark Capitan was here, he would be all over this six. Fev Rover. He loves this horse. And I, I Mark listens to this, so I'm sure he's going to message me tomorrow and be like, no, you're wrong. I don't like this horse. But for some reason, Fev Rover seems like a Mark horse. And, you know, it, it, if you look at this horse, you know, it made a bit of sense. I think he's got a couple of races that absolutely fit. Um, obviously he, he won the, uh, or she won the, uh, the Beverly D going this distance, uh, at, uh, not Arlington. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, this, this is one, I think that they've, 
they've tried going uh, a little bit further with with some success. Um, you know, obviously one of the EP Taylor, um, but you know, may, maybe the cutback, maybe that that is going to help this horse. Um, but yeah, it's got a couple of races, like I said, that fit. You know, kind of going back and forth whether or not I would use, but. I don't know. I, I mean, also JJ is aboard, so you know Mark's going to be all about it. But well, I, have I don't a feeling... know. Tom Morley's not the trainer, so that's uh, true. Maybe, maybe not. I would like Fev Rover a little bit more, if not for the presence of a couple of speed horses. And I don't necessarily think these speed horses are going to be factors in this race. But royalty interest almost certainly has to go from the 12 hole, right? And there are a couple of other horses that have shown some early speed. Sparkle Blue, horse number nine, has shown a little bit of early speed. Uh, I don't think Fev Rover is going to be alone on the front end. I wouldn't be surprised if William Buick is instructed to send English Rose out of the gate just to ensure that a repeat of last time does not happen. I think there is going to be a little bit of a pace signed on. If there are some scratches and a couple of those horses wind up not running to where Fev Rover winds up being a potential lone speed horse, uh, I could potentially see that. But also you've got to deal with the fact that this horse hasn't run since November. I can toss the Breeders' Cup filly and mare turf easily enough. It's safe to assume something went wrong, but that's a really long break, Josh. Yeah. Uh, my friend uh, my friend Dave, huge fan of Warlike God. It's probably his favorite horse in training, so I know he's going to have a large bet uh, on, uh, on her. And uh, Mark told him that... Uh, you know, you're burning money. So screw Mark. I like Warlike Goddess as well. This is one that's got in five starts at Saratoga. It's got three, three firsts and two seconds. I mean, and at least one of those seconds was an absolutely bizarre ride. That was the grade two flower bowl from 2022. Look at those fractions and tell me why Warlike Goddess was as far back as she was. I'm surprised Joel Rosario got to ride her again. Yeah. So. Let's uh let's move on to the last race here. The and now, kids, it's time for everyone's favorite game show. Josh hates money. Insert uh, the can't be show tune right here, folks, because I got to tell you, I don't think Torpedo Anna loses the Acorn. Yeah, I, you have a you have Torpedo Anna as a as your single here, and uh, you know. This is kind of going back to the horse that you talked about uh, as your single um, for the pick five in uh, in race eight. I, I look at the form. Um, obviously, the fantasy was a very very good race, and I know we we had at a certain point trashed the character of Oaklawn Park and its races. Um, I have never trashed the character of Oaklawn Park, especially after they hired Matt Dinnerman as the announcer, one of the all-time good guys in the game. I will never trash the character of Oaklawn Park. They, let's get that straight right now. I don't know well, who it was. That, that was well, the, it wasn't me. The horses coming out of it did not look good. The horses well, coming out of the preps. What you just said, though, you're trying to get me thrown under the bus. And look, there are people that hate me that don't need me thrown under a bus to hate me. So stop <laughs> trying to play to that crowd. Um, but, you know, I, I think she proved proved this wrong and, you know, ran really well in the Kentucky Oaks and, and, and won. But, you know, that Kentucky Oaks was run over a sloppy track. And funny things always happen at sloppy tracks at Churchill Downs. And, you know, I draw a line through that race. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing a horse that's kind of come back to earth with a lot of these other horses. And, um, you know, I see a couple of horses in here that have really good form if you cross out the last race that was run on a sloppy track. So I'm thinking that a couple of these horses might come turn the tables on Torpedo Anna. Hey, she might be good enough and, and, and might, you know, will run back to that Kentucky Oaks and win. But I'm going to go ahead and try and play against here um, and burn more money than, uh, than probably is needed. Because I got three horses I'm going to use in this spot. So, so hang on. Let me guess. Let me guess. You don't like Torpedo Anna. You think horses could turn the tables. You're using just FYI, right? The logical second choice? Nope. Hates money. Hates money. Nope, not using just FYI. Uh, just FYI looks like a horse. You know, I 
I love just FYI going to the the Oaks. I thought the Ashland looked like a prep race. Hey, going to step forward from that race. Did not make the step forward. Um, and looks just like the type of horse that maybe just peaked at the end of the two-year-old season. Took a, a slight step forward uh, as a three-year-old, but not the same step forward as, as we see in, in these top-class three-year-olds. So I, I'm also going to, to be fading just FYI in this spot. Okay, so to be clear, you're tossing the winner and the second place finish of the Kentucky Oaks. Yep. So clearly you think the Kentucky Oaks is a lousy race and you're not using any horses from that race, right? Uh, I'm using a horse that finished 13 by 44 lengths. Hates money. Hates money. <laughs> um, so yeah, Leslie, I have Leslie's Rose written down as a B here. Um, and... You know, this is just a horse. You, you draw a line through that Kentucky Oaks, and all of a sudden you see these fast races, and these races fit. These races look good. This is a horse that beat just FYI uh, on the fast track. I'm just going to assume didn't like the slop. And, uh, you know, if we get a fast track here at Saratoga, I think is one that can turn the tables at a bit of a price. Um, yeah, I mean, five to one, you know, not exactly, you know, we're not exactly going bombs away here, but, um, you know, at, at slightly better price horse that finished 10th by 18 lengths. Where's my ring? Number six here at eight to one, another horse, you cross out that Kentucky Oaks, you look at that progression, this horse totally makes sense here. You know, obviously finished second in the, the Santa Isabel and then went and won the Gazelle. And, you know, won the Gazelle very uh, impressively there. Um, so, you know, I, I'm just putting that line through the, the slop track and seeing, saying, hey, this is a horse that wants a fast, hard as a rock track. If we get that, um, you know, you, you look at the, the works – I mean, fired a bullet at Saratoga here. I, I think this is one that's sitting on a big race, uh, eight to one. But those aren't even my top picks. Those are my two Bs. My top pick, good old three cherry special here. Got the number eight gun song. The winner of the Black Eyed Susan, which uh, it was definitely not as good of a race as the Kentucky Oaks. Um, and, and, you know, was sitting off a pretty, uh, pretty slow pace there, but this is a horse that's shown some, a, a bit of Gulfstream speed going wire to wire, not wire to wire, but, but getting the lead going seven furlongs at Gulfstream obviously, uh, ended up winning a, um, winning a race just off at Gulfstream as well. Um, I think this is one he's going to be drawn. She's going to be drawn inside of Torpedo Anna. Uh, has been training very well. You see that you see those couple of bullet works. Um, obviously, uh, had those works going into um, the Black Eyed Susan. Uh, came out of it. Looks like it's a nice little maintenance work. And you know, I, I just think that this is a horse that has fired really nice races on a fast track. And that Pimlico race actually came back pretty good. I mean, not as good as Torpedo Anna's Kentucky Oaks, but as good as that Fantasy race. And if I think that that figure, that slot figure might, we might see a little bit of regression. I think that puts Gunsong right there at 12 to one. That's going to be my, uh, my top pick in this race, but I'm going to be three wide here. I'm going to use the eight. I'm going to use the six and I'm going to use the three. Wow. Okay. Um, I don't think Thorpedo Anna loses. Um, this is a case where I simply think that first of all, Kenny McPeak is on record as saying if Mystic Dan wasn't running in the Belmont, Torpedo Anna would be. What does that tell you about Torpedo Anna? I think that says a lot. And you okay. mentioned you, Okay. Go ahead. We're talking about Kenny McPeak here. Kenny McPeak, who's running classic causeway uh all over Europe because because he had a monster on his hands. Like Kenny McPeak is the embodiment of is the physical form of trainer speak. If trainer speak was a person, it would be Kenny McPeak. 
you know, I, I understand that you are projecting your hatred for Ken McPeak on behalf of our very nice, very handsome friend, Caleb, who I got to tell you, I don't know how he's going to figure out what happened in the acorn because he's completely muted any and all mentions of McPeak. Ken McPeak, any Ken McPeak horses, somebody's really going to need to relay to him what happens in the acorn. Okay. You want to toss the Kentucky Oaks. That's fine. Two back off of a very long layoff. This horse earns a 91 buyer speed figure in winning the fantasy. Only two other horses in the body of this field have done better. One of them is Leslie's Rose, who won the Ashland two back with, here's another Caleb reference for you, a candy ass trip. One that, by the way, just FYI, did not get. You were absolutely right. That was a prep race for her. The other one is the horse that I would use in exotics. If you're looking for a bomb and you think the Kentucky Oaks is a complete throwout and you think the sloppy track races are a complete throwout, Josh, why aren't you using Power Squeeze, horse number two in the program? Do me a favor. Go up on your past performances for me, please. I'm going to trust that your mouse is working correctly. Cross out the Kentucky Oaks for Power Squeeze. And if you just assume she doesn't run in the Kentucky Oaks, say she wakes up that morning with a cough, has to scratch, what do you have? Horse off of uh, four straight wins. Yep. And four for five over a fast track in her career. One of her defeats in her career was a distant second place finish over a sloppy track at Monmouth. I think you can throw the Kentucky Oaks out for power squeeze. She never looked comfortable in that race at all whatsoever. The rider switched to Javier Castellano speaks volumes here. I don't know if power squeeze is good enough to win. I think Torpedo Anna is better. I think just FYI is better. But if you're playing exactas and trifectas and you want a horse whose form got a bit darkened due to forces beyond their control, I think Power Squeeze is that horse. Not necessarily Leslie's Rose, who's going to be less than half that price. Not necessarily Where's My Ring, who's going to be a shorter price. I think if you're going bomb hunting, Power Squeeze is the one you want. Still, though, I think Torpedo Anna is far and away the most likely winner. And mind you, I think Just FYI is a very nice horse. You talked about how she didn't necessarily move forward in the Kentucky Oaks. She gave Torpedo Anna a heck of a shot turning for home. She made a big move and just didn't have as much left as Torpedo Anna did. I don't think there's any shame in that. I think there's every chance Just FYI may step forward third off the bench. But by the same token... Torpedo Anna is third off the bench too. So I do think there's ground that she has to make up, but I feel like the rest of this year, if just FYI avoids Torpedo Anna, she's going to wind up winning a lot of money. Still though, my top three in some order, nine, then a distance to the four, and then throw the two in for a price. All right, Andrew, I got your, uh, your ticket up here for those of you in YouTube land. You got a 50 cent ticket here. Seven dollars and fifty cents. You got the six with the two, three, four, six, seven, all the Chad rounds. Yep. With the three, five, ten, with the nine. Yep. This is a seven dollar and fifty cent play. So we're not breaking the bank. We're not going deep into the budget for Belmont Stakes Racing Festival week. But what we are doing is we're starting and finishing with singles. We're not getting cute. We're not going defensive. We're singling two horses that on paper look like the horses to beat. We're trying to get Chad Brown home in a grade one race on the turf. What could happen? And we're trying to beat English Rose in the New York. I think that's a very deep field. If you want to go really splurge and make this a $10 ticket, throw McCulloch into race number uh, 11, the third leg. If you want to do that, I have no problem with it. It just adds some more combinations onto a ticket that's going to have, at least if it hits, two pretty heavy favorites in there. So I am going a little bit light there. I'm probably pressing my strongest opinions. And if you're playing the pick five, that's still a $7 and 50 cent ticket because we're singling the Dutch row freak show that may well win by 10. What is that noise? I don't know. Yes. The Josh hates money alert. Nice. I love it. That might be my new favorite scroll in the history of on the wrong lead. Uh, well, luckily I don't hate money that much. It's only eighteen dollar ticket, but okay, good. Uh, we're we're two six with two seven with one three ten 
with three six eight. And yeah, I'm banking on uh, on two favorites losing the last two races. Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, I uh, torpedo Anna, I think is is definitely a bit of a stretch. But you know, I'm trying to make a little bit of money here. I, I do think the favorites look pretty good in the first two legs. Um, and you know, in in the third leg, I mean, if it goes favorite favorite, and then you get um, warlike goddess you know, who's going to be your third choice. You're not really looking at a, at a huge, uh, a huge payday there coming into Torpedo Anna. So a little bit of game theory here, trying to, trying to make a little bit of money. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're, we're fading Torpedo Anna and just FY in that last race and seeing if we can, uh, we can cash something. I hear that. And that's part of the reason why I went one deeper and gave you a pick five because it's the same amount of money, still a small ticket, but ultimately you wind up cashing for a little bit more money that way. Look, this is a $7.50 ticket that if it comes back and returns 80 bucks, I'm going to be thrilled. Um, it's Having said that though, the field sizes are large and that's something that's really going to help you here. This isn't something where we're looking at fields of five, six, five, six, and giving you chalks. We're looking at big fields. And credit to the New York Racing Association because this racing festival could have gone a variety of different directions, especially with the fact that there is not a triple crown on the line this year. Um, these fields, they're stacked. There are some years where the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival, which was supposed to be a Breeders' Cup preview day of sorts, has looked like anything but. A couple of years ago, when Flightline headlined the Met Mile field that was five or six horses, and there were other fields that were very short, that was incredibly disappointing from a horse playing standpoint because the undercard was just not playable. This year, a much different story, and not just Belmont Stakes Day, all week long. All right, well, that's going to do it for us here on Drinking Champagne. Andrew, what uh, what do you got going on this weekend? Where else, where else can people find you? I don't know. It's a pretty quiet week. I think I'm just going to lay back and not really do a whole heck of a lot. Um, if you're in Saratoga, buy one of these outside the track. The pink sheet is on sale. I am back in case you've been under a rock, uh, and I'm very happy to be back. If you're not in Saratoga, head to andrewchampagne.com. I'll have full card analysis, selections, and bankroll plays going on there. Uh, there's a lot going on. I sat down and previewed the Belmont Stakes with our good friend Gino Bacola over on his YouTube channel and podcast. That's what G said. We went horse by horse. By the way, I think Mystic Dan wins, and you don't want to sleep on Honor Marie bouncing back off of the Kentucky Derby, where his running line may as well have been, they're off, you lose. Lots going on. I'm incredibly blessed. This is going to be a really fun week. I'm excited. Josh is excited. Mark Capitan's excited. <laughs> Everybody's excited. And, and Caleb's backpacking. Caleb is backpacking? Yep. Is he's that gonna, legal? He's going to have to get his bets in advance. But, uh, yeah, it's I, – I don't know, man. I, how, I, is he, how is he going to carry the lighting kit that's there in every single photo as he backpacks his way across wherever he's going? You know, for such a smart guy, he did a really dumb thing uh, booking a backpacking weekend with his buddies. On... Hit the boo button. Hit the boo button right now. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I could be partly to blame because, you know, he is coming into Chicago in a couple of weeks uh, for that that Hawthorne uh Hawthorne event that we're doing out in Joliet. That's not your so, fault. Hawthorne scheduled it for that day. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. He, he, he was like, he's like, I have made a huge mistake. You know, it was, it was like uh, <laughs> the Will Arnett and Arrested Development yeah. team. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and then uh, but he says he's gonna he he's pretty sure he's gonna make the live stream tonight on Thursday night. Uh, but I got backup. I got our good friend Matthew DeSantis, Mister Naira Betts himself, this to come on. Is making the media rounds and making me seem underexposed, dude. He sent out his like his like appearance schedule. And I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. Like it, he was like, he was on like six spots every single day. Josh, what's the over under on bottles of diet Mountain Dew he consumes between first thing in the morning on Thursday and end of day on Sunday? I mean, I, I have to, you 
you know what? I don't know if he's he's probably going by two liters at this point. Really? He's okay. probably I'm guessing I'm guessing he's gone through a six pack of two liters by by the See, end. Yeah, I just have this picture in my mind of him walking around to Stone Cold Steve Austin's theme music, and instead of double fisting Coors Light, he's double fisting Diet Mountain Dew. Yeah. And then and then getting that image out of your heads, kids. And then he's at, at the end of the night, he's got to come down. So he's sipping on uh, some nice tequila. So I was going to um, say sipping on gin and juice laid back. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's going to do it for that, us. No. Yep. <laughs> uh, on the wrong lead.com at wrong underscore lead. Andrew is at Andrew Champagne. I am at Cherry Drank. Uh, we'll be live Thursday night, 730 Central, 830 Eastern on YouTube. Uh, and Twitter. Let's make some money, guys. Amen. Have a good week.